Good morning, everybody. My name is Jenna Thaler, and we're going to go ahead and get started with the virtual breakfast this morning. Um, I'm a field crops educator up out of our Huron County office. So first up, we're going to go to Dr. Chris Stefanzo with an insect bug update. I'm very picture oriented, so uh, you guys have to see a lot of pictures. Okay, so what I decided to do is uh, call through my emails first and uh, answer any questions about pictures that I've gotten throughout the last couple of weeks. So this week in identification, some of the things that people are seeing out there uh, on the screen, you see a picture of a pretty red beetle, looks like he maybe got squashed and he's on a leaf and that is red milkweed beetle. So milkweed is out on the edges of fields and even in some fields. And these red milkweed beetles are mating now and they're on the top of the plant. So if they, you know, fall onto a soybean leaf, you know, they're harmless to, to uh, beans. So nothing to worry about. On the right side of the screen, someone sent a picture in and asked, is this a Western bean cutworm egg mass? And if so, what's wrong with it are these parasitoids that have emerged. And these are actually stink bugs uh, that have hatched out of the uh, egg mass. They're kind of clustered around and they will hang out for a while and then disperse. Um, I give you a better picture here. This is not a picture that I took, but uh, Bill Ravlin, our former entomology department chair, took this picture of a different stink bug species. This is brown marmorated stink bug. Just so you can see that they cluster around that egg mass, they kind of pop the top off the egg and then they kind of cluster around there and then they will disperse. So that's happening now in fields. Um, most of the field, most of the uh, the most common species that we have in corn and beans is the brown stink bug, but that brown marmorated is moving into Michigan. So if you're scouting, you may see these little egg masses hatching. Another person sent in a couple of pictures of soybean defoliation and asked uh, these kind of these holes that are there, is this due to the grasshoppers that are in the picture or is it he also was finding green stink bug, another species? And these are definitely... Uh, holes due to grasshopper chewing. Uh, tiny little round holes are probably bean leaf beetle, but grasshoppers are messy feeders. They kind of uh, feed from the edge of the leaf and they they work their way in. So all these holes are probably grasshoppers and we've seen quite a few out there this year. I have seen some green stink bug, but again, that's a less common species than the brown stink bug that we typically have um, in a lot of the bean fields. Here's another picture. Again, these are all from cell phones. So if you get me a, fi a, a picture that's a little bit further back, but mostly in focus, that's actually the best kind of picture for identification. Um, and they asked, what was this? And this is actually one of the aureus species. This is called a minute pirate bug. When they're tiny, they're bright orange. And there's a couple of different species. I'm not sure exactly which, but these are voracious predators. They're tiny, so they don't look like much, but they're feeding on other small insects. So the, the picture on the on, that I just kind of popped in here at the top is an aureus that's feeding on a individual soybean aphid. These have a piercing sucking mouth part that they jab into the aphid and then suck the contents of its body out. So where you see them hunting on a soybean leaf, if you notice that, uh, notice them, they are looking for aphids. And I also threw in one of my own pictures down below of an adult minute pirate bug. It's called a pirate bug because of that black and white coloration, that's what I'm guessing, and it's got its mouth part inserted into a western bean cutworm. So they are uh, kind of a cleanup crew for small insects that are, that, are, that are on plants, on corn and on soybean and other plants. So they, they're, they're very common, they're always there, but you got to have good eyes and really be looking to actually notice them. Okay, so those are just pictures that I got in this, this past week and thought I would share. Uh, as far as individual insects to watch out for, uh, potato leafhopper is one. I know that Phil Cates loves alfalfa, so I threw this one in here and he had asked me to originally. So potato leafhoppers have been here since the end of May. Um, we have both, both adults and nymphs on plants. And the reason that we worry about them is when they do feed, um, they cause a reaction in the plant that blocks the uh, um, movement of photosynthate and water around in that plant and it causes a yellowing symptom that we that's called 
Hopper burn. Now, I have a picture on the screen for those who are watching of aphid nymphs compared to a leaf hopper, close up, tiny, tiny leaf hopper. So, leaf hoppers are very torpedo shaped. And they also are fast. Aphids are slow. They're like a, a sloth moving across the leaf where a leaf hopper is very fast. So when you poke at it with a pencil or your thumb, it'll move crab-like forward and back and you'll know that you have a potato leaf hopper. So right now there is alfalfa at various um, heights out there and the basic potato leaf hopper threshold does vary by height. So I've seen a lot of uh, like eight to 12 inch alfalfa that was cut a few few weeks ago and the number of leaf hoppers per, this is number, the, the, the threshold is a number of leaf hoppers per sweep. Um, and that eight to 12 inch alfalfa, if it's easy to remember, it's essentially one leaf hopper per sweep. So if you take 50 sweeps and there's 50 leaf hoppers, you're at, you're at threshold. Uh, but I have seen some fields that were more recently cut, and those fields would be at a 20 or 50 leaf hoppers per 100 sweeps. Now, if you say, oh, I can't count that high. If I do 100 sweeps, how do I keep track? Well, you know, don't do 100 sweeps at a time. Do sets of 10. That's what I do. As I get older, I can't remember numbers. So I do 10 sweeps, do a count, 10 sweeps, do a count, kind of write it down on a little piece of paper. And if I'm at, uh, you know, one per sweep on, on average and eight to 12 inch, then that would be threshold. And what you're trying to avoid is that yellowing, because when you have yellowing, you already have some damage within that plant. Um, Alfalfa is one crop that I think if you scouted it more, you might actually spray it more because you would do a better job at controlling that potato leaf hopper. Uh, we also have dry beans that would be out there and the, uh, potato leaf hopper likes dry beans too. And in that case, you're picking leaves, not leaflets, leaves, the trifoliate leaf, and the threshold is one per leaf. So the threshold is actually pretty low on dry beans. Your seed treatment on dry beans will protect to a certain extent, um, but it's probably running out now. Want to move on to western bean cutworm. Uh, western bean cutworm traps have been pretty high. Some of the extension agents on this morning said they were counting uh, oh, 200, up between two and 300 in in a trap. This is our trapping network screenshot from uh, July 25th. And uh, you can see as the dots get bigger, there's more in, in those individual traps. There's a lot of trapping in Michigan and Ontario and our dots are, are large. So what does that mean when you have a high trap catch? Uh, in corn, the trap tells us when to time scouting. And in dry beans, the trap catch tells us something about in intensity of catch. So the more years that you trap, the more that a year that's high or low will stick out in your, in your mind. So in corn, you wait for peak catch, which is probably pretty close now, I would guess, maybe the next week or so. My traps have actually started to go down. And that's when you would go out and do your, your optimal scouting. And you're looking for those egg masses uh, a little bit higher on the plant from about the, the, the eye level up. Those egg masses will be laid as they get, I have pictures here showing the darker the egg mass, say this is about a five day kind of time frame. They're white when they're first laid, they're purple when they are just about to hatch probably that same day. And here's some more pictures. Right now, if the eggs have hatched on a few plants, those larvae are up in the tassels. And they will, and if there's been pollen shed, they will actually feed on pollen in those leaf axles. Here you see a minute pirate bug about to eat a couple of them, and then they'll make it down to the silks and begin to, to work into the ear. Once they've worked into the ear tip, that spray is not very effective anymore. In dry beans, we've found that they actually will bore into blossoms and kind of hide out there, and then they will begin to feed on these beans, kind of nibble away a bit. And uh, the last picture on the far right is what happens later in the season as they begin to feed on, on beans. So in corn, again, your trap counts are not necessarily related to infestation. Uh, it tells you when to scout corn. And the key is crop stage. If you're pre-tassel and just tasseling, 
that's the kind of corn that you should be scouting first, especially if your field is out of sync with the neighbors. So if you're behind or ahead everybody else, everybody's vegetative stage or you're there, they've, you know, they've pollinated already, you might be the, the trap crop essentially for some of these moths. The action threshold is a cumulative 5% or more with egg masses. So if you went out and scouted today and you're at 1% and go back and scout in five, six, seven days, and if you've got another 4%, that was threshold. And you also, uh, you would like those eggs to be hatching. So those larvae are moving up and down the plant and will be exposed to pesticide. If you're tank mixing though with fungicide, which is pretty common, as we've heard in previous weeks, we want you to optimize the fungicide timing. Um, you know, that fungicide is useless if it's not put on at the right time. Um, the insecticide's a little bit more forgiving. And, uh, you, you know, why waste the money on that expensive fungicide if you're not going to time it right? So that's corn, the trap catch. You, you could have a huge trap catch, but if your field is not attractive to those lady moths, she might be going someplace else and your, and your crop is fine. For dry beans, it's different. Dry beans, they'll sort of muddle into, and especially if the corn is done around, there's nothing attractive, those moths will then go into dry beans and kind of finish off egg laying. So we do know that trap counts are related to infestation in dry beans. There's not a, there's not a tie to a, to a crop stage. The higher that trap catch, the more risk to those dry beans. And in the past, what we found is about 120 in a trap uh, is like a sign that, hey, something has to be done in dry beans. And I've, I think some of the uh, trap catches from the, that we heard about this morning are over that 120, especially if your neighboring cornfields are over threshold. I've often said it's easier to walk in corn and find egg masses, and I've never seen an egg mass in dry beans because it's just so hard to, to scout. So if you're over 120, um, I would, you know, you have some flexibility in dry beans to spray. Uh, usually we say first week of August is a good time to time that, that treatment. So we're coming up for next week if you've had this high trap catch. And if you want to scout, we do have a threshold that was developed here of 12% of the pods with little nibbles on them. But that requires you to go in the field and actually look at pods. And a lot of people don't want to do that. I realize that. So I think for next week, especially up in the thumb, uh, if those trap catches stay high, we're looking at uh, our, our spray of a pyrethroid on dry beans. Related to moth trapping, I want to throw out fall armyworm. We had fall armyworm at the end of last year, late. Uh, it's a tropical pest. It's down in the southern U.S. typically. I had never seen it till last year, moving all the way up into forages and cover crops and doing some damage. But remember, in 2021, we had that really late fall. So they were lucky that they got here and they had decent weather to keep feeding on and on and on. Uh, I think I showed this, this graph a few weeks ago. This is from uh, Dr. Pat Porter at um, Texas A&M in Lubbock. He's actually, I think, on uh, today. And Pat does trapping for fall armyworm. And the blue bars are this year's trapping compared to the 11-year average, which is the hatched bar. So he had uh, two tremendous uh, peaks of flight in May and then again in uh, uh, June. And I think he said the next flight is, is imminent. And those flights then generate a lot, a lot of fall armyworms that could then be blown up or moved up on Jeff Andreessen's weather fronts to us. Now, in fact, we're starting to get some fall armyworms in our trap catch. Uh, this is last week's trap catch and I couldn't update for this week, but I see a little dot uh, in the Columbus area in Ohio. And then um, south of Kalamazoo, there were a few in, in, in catches. I had two yesterday. It's not, it's not reflected here, but I had two in a trap on campus. And last week, we found a couple up at Saginaw Valley. So I'm not panicking. I'm just saying that they are moving. They're starting to move north. And I think that would require a very a warm fall again uh, for them to get much of a foothold and do much for us. Another corn insect to watch for right now is corn rootworm. Another week or so, this is when you're going to see a lot of the rootworm damage man manifest itself if, if it's there in continuous corn. So things like um, 
plants that are really super pineappled because they have no roots, the lodging that occurs when there's some wind, and uh, even just the leaf feeding that can happen in some of these fields that have tremendous numbers of rootworms. Now, I haven't had a, a haven't seen a corn rootworm field for a number of years, like any kind of bad, unexplained kinds of things. Since about 2013, they've just kind of decreased and have been hovering low. But I did uh, get an email yesterday from Canada that they're already getting a couple of unexplained um, uh, fields, un un unexpected injury calls to BT corn that they have gone to visit. So we're right at the time that if you are a dairy farmer, you have continuous corn, maybe you're just curious about your corn rootworm load, this would be the time to look in those fields and see what's happening. And besides the, the drought, you see the firing on the, on the, uh, uh, of the corn where it can't get nutrients because it just doesn't, does, just doesn't have roots. So you'd have to dig those roots up and see if you have, see if you have uh, the in insects there. Uh, in soybean, what else might you see right now? I haven't seen a soybean aphid field yet this year. It's been great, so we want to keep it that way. But double cropped or late planted beans, we might have some. They're more at risk because they get the flight from the earlier planted fields. So those are the fields, if you're, if you're interested, go out and look. They especially like potassium deficiency, that's sort of candy for them, and they will increase quite heavy there. There's a lot of reasons not to spray aphids. So just don't, if you're going over the field one more time with fungicide or something, just don't throw insecticide in the tank. You're killing your biocontrol. You're creating re resistance. You might flare spider mite, which could be bad. You're going to run over beans and there's always pollinators out there. So we have, we're getting a lot of free biocontrol and let's not mess it up. A couple things, again, that might be out there still. Silver spotted skipper is out there. I always get calls about this pest. It, it's not really a pest. It's more of a curiosity. It'll fold the leaf over itself and make a little house, and it'll change that house every couple of days. And it's quite impressive. Uh, big when, when it's large, it's about almost half the size of my pinky, probably. Very, uh, uh, very pretty kind of thing, but harmless. It's just kind of a curiosity. And there's some defoliators out there. I've seen bean leaf beetle, there's Japanese beetle on the edges of fields. And that threshold that the entomologists have now adopted for the entire region during R1 to R5 is 15% defoliation. And that's of the field, not of an individual place where some Japanese beetles are hanging out. So again, I've seen a handful of fields in 25 years that needed to be sprayed for defoliating insects. Sure, it's different in the southern part of the United States, but up here, uh, you know, that's just not something that we normally have to do. And finally, in my last minute, I want to mention spider mite. Spider mites are worse in hot, dry areas. There are some areas that have gotten rains, but as you go further north, we haven't. And as the ditch banks have dried out, these mites will move into fields. I like to use a visual rating system. This is a, 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 something that I've uh, kind of kind of come up with. It's, it, at the end, I'll give you a website to find this. But what you're looking for is like a level three kind of field that would warrant a rescue treatment in beans. And that means that you have some severe yellowing maybe along the edges, but mites have moved into the entire field. Not just something like this, this level two here is just sort of mites on the edge. We're talking about something where you're, um, you're starting to get uh, mites throughout the, the field. Once you get to fields that look like this on the far right, where there's browning and leaf drop, you know, this yield is already done and there's no yield to protect. So if there are mites out there, they will get worse as we go into August. It typically gets uh, hotter, Jeff will tell us that. But what you're looking for is hot and then dry, meaning dry under the canopy. So a severe rain, a big rain, doesn't necessarily produce that humidity under the canopy that, produce, that um, encourages the pathogens that kill mites, the, the um, fun, fungal pathogens. Same as in corn. Again, I use kind of a visual rating. I'm not sure where the spray threshold is on corn, unlike in the Southern US where they, had, where they would spray for mites and be good at it. We don't have mites very typically, and we don't have a lot of um, experience, at least 
I don't in making those sorts of calls. So when you're starting to get webbing on the undersides of leaves and, and, and stippling, that was when the spray uh, perhaps should be done. So some resources here, you could take a picture of, of this slide if you had to or a screenshot, but uh, our insect management guide is completely free. I'm showing it up here over my face too. All the chapters are on the um, uh, CANR field crop site, and this is for Michigan, Ohio, Michigan and Ohio. The Great Lakes and Maritimes Pest Monitoring Network has all of our free pheromone information. And my, all my little extension bulletins, including the ones on mites, are posted on my field crops page, uh, which is from the College of Ag and it's field crops entomology MSU. So you could Googleize that and find all of that. So with that, I will stop share because I'm going to be here all day anyway. And we'll go back to, uh, I guess, Jenna or Jeff for our weather update. All right, and with that, we're going to move on to the question and answer section. And it looks like we only have a few in right now, so if anybody has any questions here, please remember to put them into the chat for us. The first one we have is for Chris. How long does it take the western bean cutworm egg masses to mature from white to hatch? About five to seven days. So if, you're, if you scouted today and you found a bright white egg mass that was new, and then you came back the next week, it would be hatched by, by then. So if you scout on a six or seven day schedule, you're not gonna double count those egg masses. And Jeff said it was gonna be really, it was, was gonna warm up here. So, you know, you're with warmer temperatures, you're probably at that low end of about five days. Perfect, the next one is for Jeff. Will relative humidity be unseasonably low heading into the first week of August with the dry 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day forecast? Right. And, and probably need, need to make a distinction here. It will be given where we are right now and given a couple of days of, of relatively cool conditions, we will see our, our relative humidities somewhat lower than normal, but that's temporary because as we look at that change, next week, we will go to uh, the opposite and we will likely be above normal in terms of, of relative humidity, especially towards the middle and latter part of next week and then maybe beyond that. Again, I'll put a plug in for that humidity though, as you move into August and you get start to get uh, humidity in the morning and dewy mornings and those sorts of things, that under the canopy, if you have a canopy, that's how you kill insects. So uh, mites, they're not insects, but mites and potato leaf hopper and soybean aphids, they all get a fung they all get different fungal pathogens that kill them that probably are more effective than you could even do with a with a spray under under a canopy. So the the good thing about that higher humidity is it's sort of, you know, yeah, you're getting plant pathogens, but you're getting insect killing pathogens as a positive thing. Perfect. The next question we have, I'm not sure if we have any of our specialists on who, who want to take a stab at this. If we do, please feel free. Um, the question was tar spotter. Tar spotter is predicting favorable conditions for tar spot development now. Thoughts on treatment given the long-term forecast is not favorable for disease development. I didn't see Marty or Manny on. If you are, please feel free to jump in. Otherwise, Bill, I do apologize. Um, Bill, did you have a stab at this question? I think, Bill, you have got a great point when you say that the forecast is not favorable for disease development with a very dry forecast. That's one of the things that Marty will talk about as the what ifs. So without having a lot of moisture to drive that particular disease, that's a tough call. And I, I would rather prefer to have Marty make the... Uh, statement on whether or not we should be looking at a treatment or not. There's a lot of what ifs to go along with tar spot anyway. And uh, I do think that those that are irrigating, that's something that they want to consider. But for those that are not irrigating, our recommendation has been to consider an application or a treatment at the green silk stage, and we are there for most fields right now. Beyond here, uh, I'm not sure what the prognosis would be. I would let Marty answer that question. Anybody else from the field crops team want to uh, chime in on that, Paul or Eric? I'll defer to Marty. 
we're all afraid to touch that plant pathology side <laughs> because it, because you can you know again it's a, I respect the fact that the plant pathologist has to discuss that so I think but, it's but, but again if there's going to be a spray it should default to that fungicide the optimal fungicide timing and don't wait around to see if insects come in and then you throw the fungicide in with the insecticide I'd say there's the fungicide would be the the priority for the timing I haven't seen any in the county. I looked yesterday on my moth trap run and talking to one particular grower, you know, it shows up that the tar spot shows up so quickly and it can really impact the yield. You know, I just to be diligent about watching and let's wait for Marty to comment. Bill, can we get a, can, can we post a update from Marty at the website and get the emails for the people that had the specific question? And um, I'm sure Mar Marty's a busy guy, but I'm sure he'd take the time to get that up for us if, uh, or find the answer for us and get us an update and we can post that. I think, I think what I can do. He's on vacation this week, so it might be maybe some even someone in his lab, and I don't know who that would be, but we might be able to get uh, one of the postdocs or somebody who's doing this tar spotter thing. Me. There are ways that I can get the information to everyone that is part of virtual breakfast. And I can do that through an email and send that to them. But posting on the website, it's gonna be hard to have just a question and answer posted on the website. I just ran a, a, a risk forecast on one of the fields that I watch and we're at 85% uh, high risk. And that's in Southern Isabella County. I think Bill is located in Wisconsin. So it may be a little bit different even for him than it is for us. I'm looking at the Purdue website to see what they're, I always check, you know, check those newsletters to the south of us a little bit. Well, while they work on that, um, again, any more questions, drop them in. I know I've had a couple of questions and I know it's not typically a question you may get, Chris, but I've had some questions on um, plant bugs in alfalfa. So like a tarnished plant bug? The, um, what? Well, they sent me a picture of half a bug, but something similar yes <laughs> so tarnished plant bug or there's there's and then there's alfalfa plant bug as well there's a lot of them so we're sampling hemp right now uh, for the last couple of weeks and basically the bags full of plant bugs so uh, they would do well especially right now even if it's a little drier it's another thing where if it's a little drier they probably do a little bit better were they looking for a threshold or what was the um, yeah, they were curious what the threshold would be. Okay, as you know, I'm paging through my book <laughs> because it's, um, yeah, there's, I don't have a threshold in. No, I paged through your book when they asked. Yeah, I, and it, it's because they usually, by the time you, if you have that many in there and it's time to cut, then cut. But those suckers will then move. Like if, if you have sugar beets next to your alfalfa, they will actually then move over to sugar beets, at least the adults will. And sometimes we get stinging of beets. And again, we've been unable to recreate that damage or, or get a threshold in beets for that. But a lot of times by the time you, you, were, you would have seen damage from their feeding, that was from like days before. So you're always, you're always behind the eight ball with them. So I would say if they're getting that many... I, I don't know the alfalfa in your area, how tall it is, where is it in the, th the thinking about cutting, but you know, if it is able to be cut and they feel like they have a lot of plant bugs, that would reduce the problem Perfect. because there isn't really a, a guideline. Thank you. Do we have any other specialists on today who have anything they would like to share? Jenna, this is Mike Staten. I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Just, I... This recent rain through Western and, and uh, Central Michigan, I think maybe it's worth running the uh, spore caster for white mold. Folks that have a, a lush soybean crop uh, might want to run that because we're nearing the end of the application window for white mold fungicides. R3 is typically the, the last opportunity to, to apply a fungicide for that uh, particular disease. And spore caster will be your best tool to make a prediction whether what your risk level is. So I would encourage producers that have nice looking soybeans to, to run that. 
Thank you, Mike. Any other specialists on who wanted to share before I jump to this other question? All right, Chris, Mark had a question for you. Do you have any thoughts on what we may expect for stink bug pressure this summer? Soybean pod development may provide a juicy meal. Yeah, so we fortuitously uh, have a North Central funded stink bug project that's going on this summer. And I'm sampling uh, four fields. We, we've actually sampled like for the last six years, we've done a lot of stink bug sampling. And after wheat gets cut, then stink bugs begin to move into soybeans. And in Michigan, it's the brown stink bug that, um, ha, you know, it's not, it was 95% of our, of our sweeping. This year, we have sticky traps on the outside of the field, clear sticky traps. And we're doing this down at, um, down near Battle Creek, and then two fields kind of in the Ingham County area, and then one up in the, up in the thumb. And we're watching these stink bugs kind of move into the field. The threshold is 40 stink bugs and 100 sweeps. But, you know, I do a lot of sweeping in soybean, and I, I realize that people don't want to walk out into soybean fields. You know, it's just, it's it's hard. And, you know, so the sticky traps on the edge of, edge of the field may be a better way to sample for these. And what's interesting is we're getting a lot of that brown marmorated species this year on, the, on those sticky traps, where in the past we've had a lot of brown stink bugs. So, Thus far, the numbers seem less than in the previous years, but those will ramp up in the next two weeks as the egg laying happens and a lot of these nymphs kind of come through. So yes, it's something to watch for towards, but a lot of times our numbers don't peak until the very end of the season. Like it's almost football time at MSU and I'm out there sweeping and your net's full of, and, and what are you going to do at that point? You know, you're not, probably not going to drive in there and run over all your tall beans and, uh, and spray. So um, I have had almost nobody tell me that they find stink bug stung beans, that the kind of the shriveled beans that they attribute to stink bugs, like you see in the South. But if you're seeing that, that's the kind of thing to report at the end of the season. Oh, are, do, are we actually seeing more of that? But this year doesn't seem any worse or, worse or better than a, than, a, than a previous year for, of sampling stink bugs. Thank you. I see Paul gave us an update from Marty. Uh, Marty texted that the apps have been running high for a while and he, that he'd pay attention to moisture, rainfall, and heavy dews. So that is the update from Marty concerning that tar spotter. Lyndon, did you have anything you wanted to share? No, other than we've uh, most of the irrigated area has done really well on rain recently. Um, but just be prepared for when that shuts off. And uh, on a lot of the schedules we're working for our uh, test plots and things, that's uh, Tuesday and Wednesday next week. So um, rest while you can and be ready to jump into the irrigation as we need it. Perfect. And I don't see any other specialists on, but one final call if any of the specialists have anything they want to share. All right. Well, with that, we want to thank everybody from attending, and we'll wrap up a few minutes early here. If you have any interest in joining us next week again, it's going to be Dr. Kim Cassida talking about forages. And everybody, we want to thank Dr. Chris Defonso and Dr. Jeff Andreessen for being with us again today. Thank you so much.